yeah, we're on. Okay, so it's always good to be back in Seattle, so I'm very grateful to the organizers for inviting me. So today, the main results I want to get to are ones obtained by my student, Ben Jaramillo Avila, on the four boson system. But to set the scene for that, I'll also discuss some older work by Sergey, who's here now, on the related four boson calculation and on work by my collaborators in Manchester on fermionic systems. So first, some background as to why we got into this approach. I, like a number of people here, my background is in ideas of effective field theory and the sort of rigorous applications of the RG to develop the power counting for those that we discussed yesterday. And these are well developed for a few nucleon systems and by analogy, they actually apply much better to these few atom systems close to Feshbach resonances where we've got good separations of scales. So the key thing is that separation of scales that allows you to expand in ratios of low momenta to high momentum scales. And if it's not obvious, then you can use Wilsonian RG ideas to develop the power counting and work out your expansion scheme for these theories and classify things by expanding around, normally around a fixed point, but when we've got FMOV type physics, it's actually an expansion around a limit cycle. The difficulty is when one goes beyond few particle systems to dense matter, and that originally our motivation was to try and apply this to nuclear or neutron matter. Then you lose the clear separation of scales and Although there are effective field theories for dense matter of either Fermi or Bose systems, you've got Landau's Fermi liquid or Ginzburg-Landau theory, they have their own expansion parameters, their own power counting, and so it's hard to link those to a more microscopic two and three, set of two and three body forces. So the other problem is that effective field theories because the short distance physics is just represented by contact interactions, delta functions, they're not well set up for traditional many body approaches. So some people have gone to simulating these on the lattice. The alternative was to look for some rather more heuristic method, which is based on field theory, so it, it builds in the ideas that we're familiar with from these effective field theories. And also can be matched onto these effective field theories so that we can take the input from the few nucleon systems and feed it into the, the larger problems. And so what we started exploring was a version of the functional renormalization group. Sometimes you'll see these misleadingly named as exact RGs. The exactness is a bit of a, a misnomer. They're based on, a, again, a Wilsonian renormalization approach and they've been very successful in a variety of areas from condensed matter physics through to quantum gravity. And the particular version I'll be working with is the one developed by Vetterich and his group in Heidelberg. So since this is probably an unfamiliar approach for most of the audience here, I'll spend a little time outlining the basic ideas. And then I'll discuss the application to spin a half fermions, which is a case where things are under control and we can demonstrate that they're under control. And in particular, the application to four nucleon systems, four body systems in that theory. And then. You, you consider spin one half plus isospin? No, no isospin, just spin a half. Single, single flavor of fermions with two spin states. Neutron, uh, four neutrons, if you like, or spin a half atoms. And then I'll go on to the more interesting but more complicated results in the bosonic sector where we have to face up to the FMOV effect. So the, the ground state is not symmetric? Uh, no. What do you mean by not symmetric? For fermions, <coughs> one half without isospin, you cannot make it like, symmetric. No. Yeah, so that we're not looking at a, a four-body bound state there. It's dimer-dimer scattering. So the starting point for these functional renormalization group methods is always an effective action. And the very, let's start here with the generating function. For, let's, this is for a, a theory with a single boson field. 
So this, if you like, is the partition function here. So there's the ordinary action supplemented by source terms, so we can pick out pieces with different structures in terms of the field. And the key thing here is a regulator. This bilinear in the, in the fields. And this is a function that depends on momentum and, if you like, a cutoff scale k. And the key thing is that it's going to suppress the low momentum modes. So at large cutoff, we basically have a classical theory because we wiped out all the quantum fluctuations. And then as we run our cutoff down, we bring in more and more of the physics of the quantum fluctuations, integrate it out, and include its effects in W or some equivalent functional. So that's the, the idea. We're going to start from a bare classical theory at some high scale and then slowly integrate out all the fluctuations until we arrive at the full physical system when the k tends to zero. So if, if you integrate out q greater than k, isn't it q greater than k that's suppressed? Not with this way of looking at things. <laughs> then you've done the full theory. Yeah, the full theory. Yes. It's, the, it's backwards from the normal way we think about cutoffs. So this uh, is a cutoff scale. Is Q or K? Uh, K? K is the cutoff scale. Q is the momentum. So we suppre suppress the contributions. I'll, I'll show you a, a particular function when we get on to the exa actual examples. But we suppress the, co the contributions of the low momentum modes ones with modes below k, and then as we run k down, we include their contributions until we've got everything. So the particular version that I'll work with involves taking this generating function here, making a Legendre transformation on it, so that instead of working in terms of these sources for the fields, we have the mean classical fields, which are the derivatives of w with respect to source. The other thing is that with the regulator in here, there's this extra term which is included in the transform. And that leads to a very nice looking equation. I'll skip the details of the derivation, but the, as we run our cutoff, this functional gamma changes with k, and its change is written entirely like this, where gamma 2 is the second derivative of the action with respect to the fields. So this thing here is basically a propagator. So taking a trace of a propagator with one insertion of the derivative of our regulator, it's basically got a one-loop structure. And so there's none of the sort of loop expansions that you may be familiar with in other versions of the RG. Everything here is driven by this one-loop expression, and this is why it's sometimes called the exact RG because you, have the, you don't have to worry about expanding in diagrams. And as I said before, we start at some high cutoff scale where we wiped out all the fluctuation effects, so we've got a, a bare classical action. And then as we run this down, we end up getting the full one particle irreducible effective action as k goes to zero. And in principle, the terms in that action could be terms multiplying particular powers of the fields could be, have very complicated energy dependencies because they've got all the physics in now. Thresholds, bound states, etc., etc. I'm so confused about high cutoff scale meaning you have the bare action because it seems like there's still an infinite number of modes above the cutoff that you're integrating. Um, you can match on, in that region, you can match on to what you expect from the RG or you can just put in a few relevant couplings in that region, you can actually decide which are the relevant terms you need to get started, and everything else you can set to zero. Things, things, be, things become simple when k is much larger than all the scales in the system. So this has to be a theory with a UV fixed point? Uh, yeah, I think that, yes, that's one way of looking at it. The problem is that, as usual, there's no such thing as a free lunch. <laughs> That when you say one loop structure, it means it looks like one loop, but it actually effectively includes a one loop? Effectively, as the coupling constants in here run and build in physics, they include higher loop contributions that then feed in via here into here. But you never need to evaluate anything that looks more complicated than a one loop diagram. 
because the other higher loop effects are always implicitly included in the running of the couplings that go into that diagram. Maybe let me put in the more standard relay. If we think about the delay function, when we calculate the delay function, we usually have to for the previous Is that consistent with the different state? It's consistent. I mean, you, you don't see it explicitly in that form Just because. It, as I say, the, the, the advantage of this formalism is that you never need to, to work with anything that looks like more than a one loop structure. Because the other effects are always implicitly included in the running of the couplings that feed into that. Is, is this because each loop integration is over uh, the test one shell? Yeah, you're doing, it, you're doing everything step by step, exactly. No. It's in, you're, 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 yes, uh, as written like that. The problem is, as I was about to say, this is a full functional equation. And uh, those are often difficult to solve or indeed impossible. There are no good techniques for solving them except in some very special, simple special cases. So what people do is make an ansatz for gamma and truncate it to a a manageable number of terms, and the standard approach is to work with a, a local approximation to the action expanded in derivatives of the fields. So that then now looks like what we're familiar with in the context of effective field theories, but it's, no long, it's not really a rigorous expansion anymore, because we don't know that we have a consistent power counting. We may have that at the starting scale, but by the time we've run things down, we can't guarantee that the, the power counting we had at the start remains valid. Yeah, and so, as I say, because the, the vertices in this action in principle could develop complicated non-analytic dependence on energies, poles, cuts, etc. So they're not like the vertices in, a, in a, our familiar effective field theories. So it's important to have some kind of consistency or even just sanity checks on where we end up with. We can't, as I say, rigorously quantify the, the errors associated with truncating the action, but we can check for things like stability against including further terms in the action. Do things seem to converge when we include higher order couplings? And the regulator there, we're free to choose. We can use anything, provided its functional form has the effect of suppressing the low momentum modes, and provided it goes away as k goes to zero. So one can check that things don't depend too strongly on the form of the regulator. Indeed, people have used this to actually suggest there are ways of optimizing the choice of regulator by trying to, to minimize the dependence on it. And there's a particular form due to Daniel Littim, which is optimized for the use for the context of local actions so that's the one I'll be focusing on most here. Okay so that's the, the background to this approach. Let me try and illustrate how it works in the case where we've got two species of fermion if you like spin up and spin down atom or neutron. And so I'm going to write down an effective action for spin a half atom fields and I'm going to introduce a, a bosonic dimer field. Now, that doesn't mean to say I'm going to assume that the, there is a bound state of the atoms, although there could be. It's really going to be a way of summing up strongly interacting pairs. So if I make my local truncation, and I'm going to work with non-relativistic particles always, then in the two-body sector, we've got kinetic terms for the atoms and the dimers, a self-energy for the dimers, and a coupling where a dimer can break up into two atoms, or vice versa. Sorry? Where is, K? Where is K? K is my renormalization scale, my cutoff scale. Remember, this is a running action. So all of the couplings appearing in this action are functions of K. I'll fix them at some, bare, at some starting scale and then run them down to zero to get the physics. Why do you have a Z of K in front of a phi? Uh, because in vacuum, there's nothing that renormalizes the fermions. It's a, it's a dimer field, so fermion conservation says there's no, no loop diagrams that dress the fermions. It's not just a choice of normalization of psi? 
And you chose not to normalize? No, the no. In, the, in matter where you can have interactions of the fermions with the, the, Fermi, with the Fermi C, then there can be renormalizations there of the fermions. But in vacuum, uh, baryon conservation, if it's nuclei, guarantees that there's no renormalization of, of psi. If you like, the starting point for this theory, you could have just had a uh, four Fermi contact interaction, a two body, local two body interaction between the particles. And then you could introduce the Hub uh, an auxiliary boson field, Hubbard Stratonovich transformation, to bring in the boson field. In that case, at the initial scale, the boson field would be purely auxiliary, non dynamical. But as you integrate out the fermion fluctuations, you build in dynamics for that field, and so that's, you'll get a, a wave function renormalization factor for the bosons. What if you had just worked in terms of psi? What would have gone wrong? It, it wouldn't go wrong. It gets harder, and it, it doesn't allow you to build in some of the effects we want to look at. In particular, building in a kinetic term for the bosons allows us to keep some parts of the energy dependence associated with them. Whereas if we just had a, a local energy independent contact interaction, we wouldn't make contact with that. And you can see that this, if you like, that this has come from some underlying four Fermi theory because there's actually only one combination of couplings that shows up in any physical observable, which is the ratio of this to the square of the boson fermion coupling, which is exactly what you'd expect from the Hubbard Stratonovich picture. Uh, you can't see it from here, but if you, if you, it's one of the way. It actually provides a good way of checking that you've got your equations right, that you can scale g out of the problem. Because it, the, the g, as I say, is is arbitrary because it only appears in ratios with u one or, or or with z if you're looking at energy dependence. Is g running with k? No. G doesn't have to run. Again, again well, it, it doesn't because there's nothing renormalizing the fermions in vacuum. Um, the time is in there. Uh, I'm not quite sure what you're asking about. Well, most of us are doing time-independent Schrodinger wave mechanics. Okay, so you seem to be approaching it as a time-dependent. Well, uh, yeah. Well, that's because I'm working with an action here. In fact, um, when I, when we look at the loop diagrams that come in, one, the first thing we'll do is integrate over the virtual energy flowing around the loop, and then the expressions start to match onto things you're familiar with from ordinary perturbation theory. You go to the energy shell. Yeah. Just well, to clarify, you probably, will, you probably already defined. So this K is the infrared cutoff when you do the integration. Yeah. The yes. So you become ultraviolet after you finish the integration and look at it factor. Yeah. The, the energy. Yeah, we're running K down to zero to get the physical limit. So with bosons and fermions, they both contribute to the evolution with opposite signs for the two types of loop. Um, if we look at the two-body sector, the one loop diagram, the, one loop the only one loop structure we can draw is where a boson breaks up into two fermions, and then they come back again. I'll call that a skeleton diagram. The actual pieces in here have an insertion of a regulator somewhere, so you insert a derivative of fermion regulator in one of those internal lines. If you then expand this in powers of the boson field to pick up the things with two external bosons, then you've got the full running of the boson self-energy. And we can expand that in powers of, of the boson energy to pick out the self-energy, the constant self-energy U1 and the wave function renormalization. Dashed lines are water Yes, dashed lines are bosons. The solid is the fermion. Going to higher numbers of bodies, if we go up to the three-body sector, then the local interaction we can draw as, uh, if you like, an atom-dimer scattering contact interaction. And its evolution is driven by these four skeletons here, which have a structure that will look familiar to people who worked on the Skorniakov equation. 
You've got the two basic interactions, the contact interaction, and if you like, atom exchange between dimers. And there are four ways you can stitch those together and build a one-loop diagram. So we're getting the structures that are familiar from the, the three-body physics. Yes. Not in this case. But in, the, uh, in this case, where we don't have trimer bound states, we didn't feel that we wanted to force ourselves to bring in energy dependence in the trimer channel. So we kept things simpler. And lastly, let me go up to the four body sector. And an obvious thing, and where people started in this game, was just to write down a vertex that described the contact interaction between two dimers. But that doesn't reproduce all of the physics that you'd expect, say, from the fedeyev yakubovsky equation. Especially since we're now, if we ha already have the lambda interaction in the three-body sector, we want that three-body physics to feed through to the four-body sector. And there are, so if you think about it, there are two other sorts of local interaction you can write down where one of your dimers is breaking up into a pair of fermions. So either it's in the initial or final state here, or you can have a broken dimer in both initial and final here. So these are the three local structures that are needed. We worked on this in the fermion case, Sergei and Richard in the bosonic case, and it's important in, in both cases to include those. I won't try and draw the skeletons for the evolution of these three couplings. There are 27 different diagram structures, and then multiple places you can insert derivatives of regulators on the internal lines in those. Uh, some of us are old enough and stupid enough that we did this by hand. My younger collaborators have automatic ways using Mathematica of generating all of these structures. But it was useful to have the two ways as a, an independent cross-check. OK, so those are the structures. As people have asked about, the other key input is a regulator. And the results I'll, almost all the results I'll show here, I'll pick a sharp regulator. So there's a step function. So this only affects momenta q, which are less than k. And basically, this piece here cancels the ordinary kinetic energy of those modes and replaces it by a constant, k squared over m. So for large k, those low momentum modes get their kinetic energy replaced by a large constant. And that suppresses their contributions in the loop diagrams. So that's, as I say, it's not completely cutting them off, but it's massively suppressing their contributions. As we run the cutoff down, fewer of them get suppressed, and the ones that are get less and less suppressed. So in the end, as k goes to 0, we're back with the full, full loop contribution, full contribution of the fluctuations. This is the one that Daniel Litton showed was optimized for local effective actions, giving the, the best convergence at that truncation. What's the most naive thing to use? If you say this is the optimal, what's if you just put, uh, there are lots of zero below you could um, I'm not sure that there's any particular natural naive choice. This is a nice one, especially both because it's optimized and because it makes the integral simple by replacing the kinetic term by a constant. So it's, a, it's one of them. Yes. 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 There, there, there are other, yeah. You could do, just add a constant onto the energy, but, but, but this, this is slightly nicer and it has a, a formal justification. Boson's very similar form. Let me, though, put in a constant C that will allow us to adjust the boson and, and fermion cutoffs relative to each other. The optimum choice uh, Jan Pavlovsky showed is actually C equals 1, so that basically you're integrating out the two sets of fluctuations at roughly the same rate. But by varying the relative amounts, we can check whether things are sensitive or not to our regulator. Initial conditions, we want to start from the idea that we just have some interaction between the fermions. So our boson field is purely auxiliary. So we could either set it to, so we can set it to 0. 
the u1 would be the self-energy for the bosons turns out to be a relevant parameter related to the uh, non-trivial fixed point in the, the two-body sector. We fix the initial value so that when we run things down in the two-body sector, we get the, our desire, some desired two-body scattering length for the fermions. So that, that final condition in A allows us to fix it, the initial condition. The other couplings are all irrelevant as well in the, in, in the high, high cutoff limit, so we can set them to zero. So actually, we, could, we can either set them to zero or we can look at the RG evolution in that region and have them vanish, match them onto the appropriate power law behavior. It doesn't, because they're irrelevant couplings, it doesn't matter much what we do with them. What the crucial thing is that we have to fix the scattering length. And that's then the, the one scale parameter in the whole theory, and that every, so everything else in the physical limit gets related to that. If we're actually interested in the case where dimers are bound, so the scattering length is positive, so that we have a dimer binding energy, then it, it makes more sense to choose our expansion point in energy not to be zero energy, but to be the dimer binding energy. So after all, that, if we're interested in dimer, dimer scattering at threshold, we, that's, that's the point we're interested in, not zero energy. And this means we don't end up above the dimer breakup threshold, which could, in principle, cause problems. So no, that, 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 that's, the, we, remember, we have to expand in powers of energy because we're working with a local action. And do we expand in powers of energy around E equals zero or around this point here? In which one? You say you do one or the other, or? Yes. And so which one do you do, or which is better, or? Well, for the, different problem? A different, if, if there's no dimer bound state, then we can expand around zero energy. Okay. But if we're. So the A is negative? Yes. Positive. Then, especially since we're interested in dimer scattering, we expand around the, the dimer bound, bound state energy. And what if you're interested in any bodies? Um, in the many body system, it, it, it's more complicated because you you actually need quite different cut off, uh, cutoffs because you're expanding around a Fermi surface. Uh, I, let me not not go into that here. It's not not the issues that. So we, ha we have a set of coupled differential equations. I won't bother showing them to you. They're not very transparent. They're, in this case, relatively straightforward to integrate. So let me just jump directly to the bottom line, which is the dimer-dimer scattering length, which comes from that U2 parameter, the dimer-dimer vertex, the scattering vertex, in the limit k goes to 0. So what I'm doing is plotting here the ratio of the dimer scattering length to the underlying atomic one as a function of this parameter that I introduced in the dimer regulator. So we expect the optimum choice to be around here. The black curve is the old result where that vertex U2 was the only one that people included. And if you go to this limit here, you're basically integrating out your bosons first, and you end up with mean field theory, which is a ratio of 2. If you integrate out the fermions first, you end up with the scattering length vanishing. And you can see it around the interesting region here, there's a very strong dependence on cutoff. So that, that's, that's an immediate worry. If you're getting results that are strongly cutoff dependent, then you know that you're, you haven't really got convergence in your truncation of the theory. Here, by strong cutoff defense, it means defense on CD? Yes, on the relative, the, the, here we're, we're varying the relative boson and fermion cutoffs, mm -hmm. but there was also dependence if we go from the sharp cutoff to smoother ones. So that, that means you can't really trust any of the results. And even if we just add in the three-body coupling, things are looking a little bit better, but there's still a very strong slope in the, uh, significant slope in there. Then we added in these two extra 
four body couplings, the ones that allowed the dimers to break up. And suddenly the picture changes. It's basically constant from the zero all the way out to this relative factor of two. And indeed, if you zoom in around what you expect to be the optimum choice, there's even a minimum in there. Not sure that that's crucial or not, but it, it shows that the, the strong cutoff dependence that we had with the simpler truncations has indeed been wiped out by including these extra terms. And it doesn't make much difference if we use the, the lithium cutoff or some smooth version. The results are all very similar. What is the correct answer to this ratio? Get to that in a moment. <laughs> so that just those are the comments I'm making that we get as we include these extra terms. Even though we've not gone beyond a local action, we get much better. We get things do seem to converge, and the converged result depends weakly on the cutoff. So it looks as though we're in reasonable shape, and the number is 0.58, which is in nice agreement with the results of full few body calculations. Um, if, you, if you don't have the curves. Well, the, the optimum choice is to, to keep, not to allow your bosons and fermions to get out of step with each other. So you don't want to go far from C equals 1. OK, but in one direction, it doesn't seem to make much of a difference. In the other, it does. Uh, Can you back up the slide? Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that I'd want to push in. I mean, you're right, it doesn't make much difference there. But I don't think that's a region I'd want to be in either. I'd want to be in a, a, around here. And in fact, the, the dependence is even weaker in around there because there are minima. So you're really only interested like, in, a, well, in a not, <laughs> not changing CE by a factor By more of than a factor of two or so, yeah. And the, yeah the, the Niels was able to explore this entire region like that, but I think I'm not sure that I'm interested out here or, or out there. Sign an error bar. Um, from the variation in this region around one here, but it's it's not a rigorous error bar, but it's the scale of which the cutoff, the remaining cutoff dependence is for C's close to one and for the, between sharp and smooth. Can you do narrow resonance here, like, uh, like G goes to zero? Nothing depends on G. The I mean, we, we, we can go between bound and virtual states but we, we, by changing the value of that parameter, the final value of that u1, or if you like, the two-body scattering length. Um, yeah. Um, but this, if you only have the DD vertex, you don't have the single atom exchange forces in properly. You 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 have a self energy for the dimers from the one body sector, but then all that happens is that those dimers then interact by a contact interaction. That's right. So you're you're missing important physics and. I would say that this massive slope here is telling you that something important is missing. I just want to understand the DD vertex in your language, how to think about it in your language. If you continue to not, if you run the infrared, you haven't included in your action the possibility that when those things interact, they bust each other up. Yeah. So if you don't have that in your infrared physics, that's right. that feeds into the equations, right? Yeah. Yeah, they don't show up as cuts, but yeah, yeah, it's a, yeah I'm, I'm not quite sure what you're... you're if you start from the atoms, dimers is just um, the bound state formed by the two atoms. When you have two dimers come together, um, 
I think the rule here, the, the lowest order diagram corresponding to the two box, which involve two diamond coming in, change from the uh, uh, Yeah, I mean, the. I try to think whether that's the equivalent. I mean, the way of thinking is different from the original. The, the basic interaction that drives the. Dimer dimer scattering is that one there. That's the vertex. Right. That okay, so this is one of the one of the diagrams showing in the four becoming box diagram. Yeah. If you sum this, uh, if you sum the whole series, you will get neglect. You will get two. You need to get, but you need to interpret all the becoming box. Right? Yes, you need to. No, not just one. No, if you use this as a building block yeah. of ladder, ladder series, you will get two. Oh, no, sorry, you will get 0 0.75. That was Giancarlo Strinanti got it. Okay, yeah, you, you get something that's that's larger, but yeah, I think, yeah, okay. I mean, we, we can't quite make contact with that because we don't do it diagram by diagram. We, we do it with, by this integrating out. Um, yeah, so around the optimal point, yeah, it's not 0 0.75, but it's around 1. So the three, three body couplings effectively break one of the atoms from the dimer and uh, form some three body structure. And the, yes, and then it, you can exchange across to the other dimer, yeah. And that, that physics is missing. Even if you put in a three body interaction, you're not putting it in properly. You need these two extra couplings here. And then once that physics is in, things do seem to have converged. If you did atom dimer scattering like as a check, can, do you have to re-optimize all these couplings? Or you can take what you had here, and it would give the right answer for three bodies? It should give the right answer, yes. You have to watch out a little with expansion point in the energy. Uh, but, but yes, <laughs> uh, Ben has been looking at that. You know the, you know the answer to that. Have you done atom, the atom dimer scattering way? Uh, I can't give it to you offhand because Ben did that very recently. Uh, it's just taking the result of this integration and taking the coefficient of phi. Sum. Yeah, there's a, a slight subtlety in that you want to sit here. It's easy to choose, pick an energy which puts you at the dimer dimer threshold, which is where you want to get the, that scattering length. Getting to the atom dimer threshold is a little more subtle because it's an asymmetrical situation. But we, but we can do that, and I believe the result comes out consistent with the few body calculations. But it's a different effect. You're going to do a different evolution equation? I mean, you're going to. Different only in terms of the energy, the, the energy that we're expanding around. It's that external energy E that flows along the lines. The low energy effective action that describes dimer dimer scattering is different from the low energy effective action that describes atom dimer scattering? No, no. I, I'm saying I use the same form for the expanded action, but I'm expanding around a different zero of energy, different, a different point in the external energy flowing through the lines. The effective action you're getting is completely different. No? It's not completely different. It's got it's got exactly the same form. The values for the couplings are slightly different because they're defined at different points. The couplings here. Don't you just run everything to zero cutoff? And then there's zero cutoff, but the all the external lines can carry energy in. If my fields. This goes back to the fact that it's a time-dependent action, so the fields can carry energy. And I can expand in powers of that energy. But do I expand in powers of the energy around zero, or do I expand in powers of the difference of the energy and some reference point? And so I, it's that. If I, and so if I'm interested in something at truly zero energy, say four body breakup threshold, then I'd expand around E equals zero. If I'm interested in dimer dimer scattering at the dimer dimer threshold, then I should shift all my energy, my expansion point down to the dimer energy. If I'm interested in atom dimer 
scattering at the atom dimer threshold, then I pick energy points that give me that as my expansion point. So the, 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 the terms I include in the action are the same, but the, actu but the actual values are slightly different because of the points I'm defining them at. Is that enough? For no. <laughs> for, yeah. OK, so where I really wanted to get to was the boson case. And this is more complicated but more interesting because we've got the FMOV physics going on in the three-body sector. The basic form of the action is going to be the same. I'm going to include the same types of couplings. And the structures in the evolution equations are going to look very similar, just with different numerical coefficients because bosons, not fermions. And in this case, if you look at the three-body sector, that coupling lambda, instead of being an irrelevant coupling, is now periodic as you run the, scale, as you run the evolution scale down. And it has the, the same sort of pattern as a, in the FMOV effect, and as Sergei and co collaborators showed, that with this local truncation of the action, the parameter that controls it is 0.92 instead of 1. So it's within 10%, although that's possibly misleading because it's going to get exponentiated in here. So the actual momentum the scaling factor is going to be a, a bit different from the true FMOV one. But nonetheless, we are getting the FMOV behavior in the three-body sector. And if you just work with the local action of exactly the same sort I showed a moment ago, but with bosons instead of fermions, then you see these three-body FMOV bound states, but there's no sign of four-body bound states, at least provided you're careful with the numerics. So the problem being that the three-body bound states produce poles in the three-body coupling, and integrating past those requires a little care. So if we've got but three body bound states, then we felt that we needed to include something that would give some of the energy dependence associated with that. So we introduced now not just a dimer, but also a trimer field. The other thing is that when we do that, we can actually start to match directly onto the structures of the Fedeyev Yakubovsky equations because we can have coupling between the dimer dimer and atom trimer channels. So the full effective action we start from is a mess. It looks like this. So we've got our three fields with kinetic terms. These are dynamical fields, so they can be renormalized. There's self-energies for them. There's the coupling of two atoms to a dimer, or an atom and a dimer to form a trimer. I've written down all the possible local couplings here. So that we've still got lambda. That's my old U2. These are the breakup vertices associated with it. Then we've got a local atom trimer vertex. And we've got the coupling between the atom trimer and dimer dimer channels. And then there's another breakup type vertex there. So it's a bit of a mess. And we don't want to have all of those couplings. Because if we've got coupling of atom and dimer to form a trimer, and then trimer self-energy here, why do I need to include this as well? In the two-body sector, if I'd got rid of the basic fermion-fermion vertex at the start, then if I you know, made a hubbard stratonovich transformation at the start, then that vertex remained zero through the evolution. It wasn't reconstructed. The problem here is that even if we get rid of lambda at our starting scale, it gets regenerated by the evolution. There are loop diagrams that recreate it. So the trick, again, from the Heidelberg group of introducing running fields so that you can eliminate some of the couplings. So for example, we've actually put an explicit k dependence in the trimer field. So there's a term like this with a coefficient that then cancels out the running of lambda. So if we set lambda to 0 at the start, it will now remain zero through the evolution. The other terms here are introduced to get rid of the breakup terms in the four-body four sector. So that in the end, what we're going to be left with is just the vertices that match onto the Fedeyev-Yakubovsky structure, coupling the, the two types of four-body channel. 
in the fermion case, would it have been advantageous to have a evolution equation for that boson field? For, the, uh, for adding, you mean adding in a trimer field, it, it, we didn't seem any. It didn't seem necessary, because we weren't. We don't. We didn't have bound states in the three fermion system. Right. But, but, but here you're, you're introducing an evolution equation for the trimer field to do some simplifications. In the fermion case, could you have made some simplifications by introducing an evolution equation for the boson field? N not needed in the, in vacuum. In, in matter there, the, where there are, you know, there, if you go to fermionic matter, then there are f effects that can start to re regenerate the four Fermi vertex. So you might then want to have your boson field evolving to get rid of that, so to keep it zero. But in vacuum, no, that, that's not needed. So we get, we get rid of the, these couplings that don't match onto the structure we're looking for. The evolution equations get slightly more complicated. There's an extra term from the explicit k-dependence of that field. And I won't, won't actually give the form of the equations. They're, not again, not transparent. In the three-body sector, we now have running self-energy for the trimer, wave function normalization, and a running coupling in this case. In the scaling limit, all of these show sinusoidal oscillation with the scale. They all show the FMOV effect. And when you take the effective three-body coupling, h squared over u, that shows poles every time, every time if you like, a three-body bound state comes through zero energy. So we get the we see the FMOV states appearing one by one as we run our scale down. The FMOV cycle is slightly too long because this parameter is slightly too small. So the scaling factor is 30 instead of 23. It's the same number that you mentioned a couple slides ago. That's right. The introducing the trimer field hasn't really changed the structure in the three-body sector. So the, the the scaling factor is exactly the same as Sergey got without it. Do you have any idea what you need to do to get a more active um, Momentum and energy dependence, yes. Yeah, the, the one of the things Sergey and your group did in Heidelberg was to put in the full energy dependence in the two-body sector, including you know, like the square root behavior at the two-body breakup threshold. When you, you can actually still solve the, the three-body RG equation like when you put that in, and then it exactly reproduces the STM equation. In fact, when you, what you're really doing there is solving the Schrodinger equation by a totally non-standard method. <laughs> Rather than doing it the usual way, working with all momenta, you're doing it. Sh you're solving it shell by shell in momentum. But I think that's probably about the last case where one can actually g get the, these equations to match exactly onto the, the few body sector. I don't think it, that the energy dependence can be done exactly in the four body sector. So that's in the region where we're much larger than our one physical, our cutoff's much larger than the only physical scale. So everything just scales with the anomalous breaking from the FMO effect. Once we reach cutoffs of the order of the physical scale, then the FMO tower, of course, terminates. And there's always going to be a last bound state. So we've got these rather dramatic oscillations in the three-body sector. They are going to feed through to the four-body sector. So if we're in the scaling limit, we're going to see repeated identical cycles as we run our cutoff down. So this is plotted as a function of the log of the cutoff. So our evolution runs that way. So you can see that things go through singularities, drop through poles. This point here, the gray line, is where the atom trimer threshold drops through zero energy. So that's where the, we've got an atom trimer state at exactly zero energy for this value of the cutoff. If we go beyond that, 
then we see what we expect. The coupling develops an imaginary part because now there's an, an open atom trimer channel. So large K is your starting value, or yes, um, yeah. So I, I forget which cycle this is. Ben started somewhere out here, went through a couple of cycles to make sure we were free of any transients, and then this is a, a typical cycle here. And we see this picture repeating and repeating. Sorry, where is the lowest energy tetramer on this graph? Uh, OK, let, let me give you the other landmark. So the, the threshold is here. The dashed line is the imaginary part. You can see that appearing there. This ugly structure here is an artifact. It comes from, it's driven by the fact that the, there's a terms that go like one over the trimer coupling, and the trimer coupling has to vanish there. These structures here are tetramer poles. They're bound states. The, the real part goes to infinity. You can just about see that there coming back here. And so we. You can see three of them, but they're actually more <laughs> invisible in there. I'll, I'll blow that region up in a moment. They've, these imaginary, they've got imaginary parts as well as real parts. And that's physics, because there are deeper bound trimers over here. So these states can decay to form a much more deeply bound trimer and, and, and kick out a free atom. So those are actual, these, I mean, we're not at physics because this is all at finite k. We're, we're running the evolution through towards the physical limit. These ha haven't arrived there yet. But we are seeing physical effects as the evolution runs, that we've got the threshold opening up. And these things that are above a, a lower threshold do have imaginary parts. So you don't have a, uh, a three-body parameter that sets the lowest Low, lowest trimer. Uh, trimer ground state. Yeah, well, the, we always start the evolution at some scale. So there's some first cycle, and the uh, and the first tri trimer state appears there. But so below that, there should be a bound, totally bound tetramer. Yes, and the positions of things in that very first cycle are sensitive to our initial conditions because there are transient effects. But once we get beyond that first cycle. Everything then repeats until we reach scales of the order of the physical scattering length. And if we How many do you have for each trimer? We'll get to that in a moment. So that, that, as I said, that's the pattern in the cycle. And Ben had to work quite hard on the numerics, because to integrate past the poles in the three-body sector, you have to ima add on imaginary parts. And then you have to take those artificial ar imaginary parts small enough that you actually get things converging. And you can see the, the physical imaginary parts here. So he checked quite carefully that the, these are, these survive as he takes his uh, regulators to zero, his imaginary. So we're seeing here three four body states in that FMO cycle. Uh, I think I've. So it made most of those comments. If we zoom in just below the atom trimer threshold, we saw three states there. And now I'm plotting things here, not as a function of the log of the cutoff, but as the log of the log of the cutoff. So that threshold is now way over there at minus infinity. There's the three states we could see in the last, in the last plot. But there's more and more and more of them. And they're all beautifully, regularly spaced in the log of the log of the cutoff. So that if we, they have this double exponential pattern, which, as we were in the middle of puzzling about it, Sergei and his collaborators came up with as a super FMOV effect in a completely different three body system. So we have this amusing pattern of actually an infinite number of four-body states in each three-body FMOV cycle, at least during the evolution. As I keep saying, watch out. For k non-zero, we're not at the physical limit yet. So these could be artificial. And whereas with the ordinary FMOV effect, scale invariance says that if you've got these things 
appearing regularly in log k, they're not going to move relative to each other because the only scale that's come in is the scale associated with those states themselves. Now in the four-body sector, there is a momentum scale set by the neighboring three-body state. So we, we're not truly scale invariant. And so it's possible that these states could move relative to the threshold as we go to the physical limit. So they, they, they may not, indeed probably don't, all survive. But it, it's still, it's, it's an interesting structure when you're clo having, close to having an FMOV cycle, but not quite there. You can get this double exponential. So physical limit, k going to 0, let's and this is now for finite scattering length, and this is negative, so we don't have a two-body bound state, so we're g going to zero energy. So the final cycle starts out looking like what we had before, but as we get closer and closer k to the order 1 over a, things start to look a little different. The scaling that kept things visible is no longer working, and there is a, another bound state pull there, but with a tiny residue on the scale. And I've adjusted A0 here so that the final three-body state appears at zero energy at the physical limit. So that threshold is way over there at infinity. And it, there are no other poles beyond just these three. So we're consistent with the old theorem of Amado and Greenwood that if you've got a three-body bound state at, at zero energy, there's no FMOV tower underneath that. Only a finite number of bound How states. Do you know what value to take? You have to do a bit of shooting. <laughs> if you get it wrong, you, you start to blow up. If you get it wrong, the other side it goes down. So you you can get you can shoot in between. Uh, when you say three states, do you mean between two FMOV trimers? There are three four-body states. There, there's three four-body states in the last FMOV cycle. There's a trimer threshold here. And the last one is over there at minus infinity. And there's just one, two, three poles in this cycle. I can't yet, because that would involve going to finite energy. But uh, uh, if there's time, I'll say something that might, may connect to that later. But the, uh, to get, as I say, to, get, to make contact with physics, we need to have things that appear at zero energy in the limit k goes to zero. So I just tune things so that the three-body state appeared at zero energy. I can adjust the two-body scattering length so that I can get the four-body states to have exactly zero energy. So I can look at the dissociation points for all of these states and look at the ratios between them. So the lowest four-body state relative to the nearby three-body state, the, the, the scattering lengths that give those are a ratio of 0.43, first excited state, 0.87, and then the last one, 0.99. And these are actually nicely in agreement with your and Deltuva's results. I think the few body calculations give something like 0 0.42 here and 0 0.92 here. So we're within about 5% of those. This state is obviously incredibly weakly bound, very, very close to the, the three body bound state. I'm not sure if it's real. If it is, it's going to be a real challenge to try and determine numerically or experimentally. But it could easily just be an artifact of our truncation. Remember, our FMOV cycle is too long, so that does leave more, more scales available, possibly just enough for this state to sneak in as a bound state. If we improved our truncation and got our FMOV cycle down, we would probably lose this. A final quick comment to lead into things that Tobias is going to talk about in a moment. If I go back to the super FMOV type of regime, then we're in a system where there's a single scale set by the nearby 
three body bound the scale at which the nearby three body bound state appears. So we've got this double exponential form for the four body scales set by the three body scale and an exponential of an exponential. If we take ratios of these, then we find that they're all related to, uh, to ratios of the four body scales to the three body scale. As I say, basically, it's all driven by the fact that there's one scale in the problem, the local K3. So this is the same sort of scaling function as Tobias is going to show us in his approach. The functional form is different. Also, we don't find any need for a new four-body scale parameter. Alpha here is fixed for us. Once we're beyond the transients of the first Efimov cycle, all the Efimov cycles look alike. We can play with our initial conditions. The first cycle can look quite different if we choose the strong distortions of the initial parameters. But those are all irrelevant transient effects. They die out. And as I say, once we're beyond that, everything just repeats with the same structure, independent of initial conditions. OK, I should be wrapping up now. So let me summarize. What I've been outlining are these applications of a functional RG to few body systems. The, the results I've been showing have all been based on a local effective action with these optimized cutoffs. And the crucial thing that we found in the four body sector was the need to keep all of the local four body terms. Let me say that if you think, one would like to think about it as a way of putting in correctly the, the three body subsystems in the Fadea of Yakubovsky type picture. For fermions, we got results for the dimer-dimer scattering length that, provided we, we did this, were stable against variation of the cutoff and in good agreement with the direct few body calculations. In the bosonic case, we introduced a, a dynamical trimer field to bring in energy dependence and to directly match the Fadea of Yakubovsky structure. We find that the thresholds behave correctly. We get thresholds opening up at each atom trimer threshold. During the evolution, we get these infinite super FMOV type towers of states below each atom trimer threshold. But for finite two body scattering length, when we go to the physical limit, we only have three states in the last cycle. And at least two of them seem in good agreement with the exact few body calculations. OK, let me stop there. choice of effective action to, in order to get, the, you have to know the correct answers in order to tune the form of the effective action to get the correct answers. So what would you do if you wanted to address the unitary Bose gas, where you don't know the correct answers? I would start with this action here and see how, see how it works. Um, I mean, people at Heidelberg, I'm not f so familiar with the Bose gas case, but the Heidelberg people did do that. Flerkinger, Stefan Flerkinger? Yeah. yeah. Didn't Stefan Flerkinger do work on that? What was done is strictly interacting both against what is called the downward RG, downward RG. So it's an unstable system, Bose gas. So it's uh, maybe not an optimist with that. So the richly coupled Bose gas. Yeah, you're right. It's the same issue we had yesterday that you're working in an unstable state above a, a deeply bound. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's a that's a problem with any, applying any effective action approach to that. So I have a question, um, a general question about this functional renormalization. Mm -hmm. um, so try to see the connection between this and the standard beta function. If I'm able to obtain a beta function for all the coupling constants and solve it at a different scales, and now I put back to the action using the coupling constant defined at scale k, would I, I mean, am I doing the same thing as what you are doing? Uh. 
It's, it's close. I don't know that it's guaranteed to be exactly the same. Yes. Okay. And in other words, if I think about the correlation function, and you know this kind of semantic uh, correlation function defined at different scale. You, you can write down differential equation for the correlation mm -hmm. function defined at different scale. And there they, talk, they introduce endpoint correlation. So I guess if I know the all the endpoint correlation, I can reproduce that. Well, yeah, I mean, those are the things that our ac action is built out of. We, we differentiate it with respect to the fields to get those correlation functions. Those are then the vertices that, okay. that, that, that we allow to flow. The yeah. Just yeah. Okay. Can you also say something about everybody states in the unitary limit? Uh, the well, body states, I'm sorry. In, no. Um, because. The, in the unitary limit, the FMOV cycle goes on forever. Uh, what I would need to do, and people are pushing me to do, is ac actually to work at finite energy, not just at zero energy. So we can try and then work out where those states end up in energy as k goes to zero. I, ben had other things he needed to do, so I, I didn't get him to digress onto that. But I, from <laughs> what people have been asking about here. I think I need to borrow his code and, and put finite energy in so that I can see what, what the spectrum is. As things are set up at the moment, all I can do is find out where things appear at zero energy as I change my two-body scattering length. Since we are out of time, uh, let's thank the speaker again. Any other questions can be postponed um, to the uh, discussion session.